Welcome to the Bucket Plan On Demand, a podcast for financial advisors based on the best-selling book and process that simplifies financial planning. Hear from skilled industry professionals and special guests each episode that will help perfect your approach with clients and your results. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of our Coffee Break with C2P. Great to be with you here on this Thursday. Very excited to be joined by two of the smartest people in the business, I think. Uh, that's why I'm going to that's this bar I'm going to put for you, Seth and Stoyan. So let me introduce our guest baristas today, and then we can dive right in into 529 plans. And again, everyone's aware of this, I think at this point, but this is open forum. So feel free at any point, if you have a question, you can raise your virtual hand, you can raise your real hand, you can put it in chat, you can just un unmute and say, I have a question, and we'll be happy to address those as we go along. So let me introduce our guest baristas. I'm going to start with Seth Meisler. He is the newest lead advisor at the JL Smith Group based out of Minneapolis. Is that right, Seth? Correct. Um, Yep. So JL Smith is steadily expanding across the country. And then our very own Stoyan, who probably needs no introduction. I think this is like seven coffee breaks you've been on already since you, you joined us, Stoyan. So great to have both of you. Today's topic again, 529 plans. And we're going to really dive more into probably the tax side of things, obviously with tax management journey coming up next week, a very relevant topic. So uh, let's just kick it off with a very easy one. So I'll, I'll throw this up to either of you, Seth or Stoyan. What are the basics of 529 plans? Can you just kind of give maybe a brief overview rundown of, of how 529 plans work for, for anybody that just may not be intimately familiar with them? So basically 529 is a section of the tax code that allows individuals to save money in a tax deferred or tax free manner if the money is used specifically for college, for an accredited university. By the way, the accredited universities are not only in the United States, they could be abroad as well, as long as they uh, have U.S. accreditation. There are a number of tax benefits to investing in the 529 at the state level. 529s are run by each state. And so all the plans have their own kind of nuances, and they can be used for a variety of expenses, for sure, tuition and fees, but also it can cover room and board up to a certain extent, books, computers, internet access. So there's a number of things that the 529s can cover. It's excluded from the estate. So it is a gift. It's outside of the estate. But in kind of something unusual, the uh, person who gifts the money into the 529 still has control over those assets. So kind of a, a unique wrinkle where you can gift it, but you still have control over it. And it can be used for, again, for designated beneficiaries, but which could include yourself. If you want to go back to school and use that money for college or for graduate school or something like that, you can do that too. So a lot of, a lot of flexibility with 529s. Awesome. And that's actually great overview. But the only thing that I would have to add to that and kind of expand on something that you mentioned, that it's considered a gift. And there are some gifting implications when you work with 529 plans that make them really exciting from a planning perspective. And we'll go that into that later uh, during the discussion. But yeah, awesome. So Stoyan, maybe you can touch on this next. 529 plans, there's, there's kind of different variations or at least two camps, two general camps of, of 529 plans, the savings plan and the prepaid tuition plan. Uh, can you maybe just touch on some of the differences between those two and, and maybe kind of pros, cons of, of each approach? Yes. So what Seth covered was the your standard 529 plan, which pretty much every one of us on the call knows about. But what a few people know is that there's also a prepaid state tuition plan uh, that's also part of that college funding um, proposition for clients. And the prepaid plans are basically um, state-covered uh, plans that allow you to prepay for state public uh, universities and colleges. So, for example, if, if I'd like to cover my kids, my newborn's college expenses, I can prepay that today in today's dollars with, with the states that allow that, that particular type of plan. And the state guarantees that uh, when my child reaches college age and they go to one of those state-sponsored colleges or universities, the tuition is going to be prepaid. 
And so that offers some flexibility from an inflation perspective. If you go back and look at, at how inflation in college tuition has gone over the last few years, and especially since the early 2000s, having that prepaid option basically guarantees that whatever the college cost is at the time in those public universities and colleges, you're not going to pay anything extra. Now, that creates a little bit of a challenge if, if the kid decides to go out of state or if the kids decide to go to a private institution. But in those particular cases, what states typically do is they average out the cost of all the public colleges in the in-state and they cover that average if the kid goes to a different college, different out-of-state college or university, and the parents are responsible for the difference or the kid itself. The kid. Got it. So see, even, even still some flexibility with the, the prepaid tuition plans. Correct. Uh, anything yeah, I just want to add, I just want yeah, to add to that, that prepaid tuition plans are only available in certain states, specifically Florida, Massachusetts, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Washington. And for all those states, with the exception of Massachusetts, it's only available to the residents of that state. So... For example, for myself, resident of Minnesota, I can't go and do the Michigan prepaid tuition. Now, for Michigan residents, where you have great state schools, uh, the prepaid tuition is an amazing option uh, that should be very seriously considered. So just something to, to be aware of. Massachusetts does allow out-of-state residents to contribute to the prepaid tuition plan. That's actually a great point because I think, for some reason, I think that Florida allows they have some reciprocity agreements with other states that allow for a prepaid tuition plan to be used elsewhere in the country. So you have to do your homework when you look at those plans and depend depends on the state of residence. Let's talk about the tax benefits. Obviously, that's the big reason a lot of people also look at using 529 plans. There's a lot of tax strategies associated with 529 plans. Seth, do you want to kind of touch on some of the tax benefits that you would see either utilizing tax 529 plans as a maybe a parent, grandparent, gifting, all of the different strategies that can come into from a tax perspective? Yeah, thank you. There's So there's a lot of tax benefits. So first of all, there are tax benefits for people who are gifting in certain states. So that's benefit number one. Um, and again, it's state specific. So you really need to look at each state in terms of what they have. So for example, Illinois, first $10,000 that's contributed to a 529 plan for each child gets a state tax credit. So dollar for dollar tax credit, if contributed to the Illinois Bright Start program. New York has tax benefits, Minnesota has tax benefits, not all states do. Also some, just kind of a quirk, like Illinois, you have to contribute to the state program in order to get the tax benefit. Uh, Minnesota, you don't. So you really have to pay attention first and look at the residents, what state tax benefits are available to them. That's not available for everyone. California, for example, has no tax benefits offered to people. So that's number one. The second thing is that distributions from the 529 are the are tax free. So any obviously the contribution is an after tax contribution, but any growth on that 529 is tax free as well. So again, if used for qualified expenses, which there's a definition of qualified expenses, but just assume again your basic college expenses, tuition, room, board, books, etc. So those are a couple of the major benefits of the 529. Keep in mind, if you're using an after-tax account to pay for college, right, like a joint account or something like that, if you were to withdraw that money, you would potentially have to pay capital gains tax or anything else. And here, you don't have that issue when withdrawing from the 529. So let's talk about the gifting side, because I, I know that's a huge for those of us with children that are either nearing college age or young children, we might have to hit up the grandparents for a little bit of this help with these 529 plans. Like what are you mentioned earlier that the control aspect that comes with it, but what are some of the gifting benefits if you do have someone gifting to a 529 plan? So the way you have to look at these is um, from a gift tax aspect, it's up to 18,000 per year per beneficiary. And, and you can 
also pre-fund that up to five years. So from an estate planning perspective, that's that's actually a pretty good planning technique. And in some cases, you can have some trusts involved in structuring those. And trusts offer some very good titling options for, for 529 plans when you plan for that. But the way you have to look at it, and it, it, it all depends on going back to what Seth uh, said a little bit ago, I, the way I look at it is is from a tax parity standpoint, there are, there are states that will give you, uh, so for example, Arizona, Arkansas, Kansas, Maine, uh, Minnesota, Missouri, Montana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Those are the states that are that I call tax parity states, and they will give you they will allow the state tax deduction or contribution deduction for in and out out of state. 529 plan so that the residents of those states are not constrained to their local 529 plan only. Then you have the tax neutral states, which are those that don't have any, pretty much all of them that don't have any state income tax deduction or state income tax period. And then you have all the other states that offer tax breaks only to uh, in-state residents like the state of Illinois. But from a gifting standpoint, if you think about it, 18,000 per beneficiary. So so most of those states that offer tax benefits, the the tax benefit is less than eighteen thousand. So to maximize your your state income tax deduction for contributions, you can contribute significantly under the eighteen thousand, which is the gift tax exemption per benefit per beneficiary per parent. So, and then you can you can use up to five years of gifting to prefund some of those accounts and take that money out of your estate and still have control over it. So that's that's the beauty of the 529 plan when you look at it from an estate planning perspective. Right. Awesome. You do have to be careful, and Stone, you can speak to this, with regards to if you have, let's say, an insurance policy, let's say in an islet or something, and you're gifting for your kids in the insurance policy and you want to make contributions to a 529, now you got to pay attention to how much you're gifting per child. Correct. So, Things to just kind of be aware of. Um, hey, guys, I thought I'd share a couple ideas, too, from a tax planning perspective, is that, like, I'll give you one example where I have a client here in South Carolina, and South Carolina doesn't actually have a cap on the tax deduction for contributions into the state plan. And so I have a client whose parents are over in the U.K., and they're pretty financially well off and they wanted to contribute to the grandkids college. And so instead of having the grandparents make the contribution directly into the 529, what we did was had the grandparents give a cash gift to mom and dad that wasn't a reportable gift to mom and dad and then mom and dad made the contributions into the South Carolina plan because that got mom and dad a fairly large, in this case last year, almost a $60,000 income tax deduction from a state perspective. Whereas if grandparents would have made the gift direct, nobody would have got a state tax deduction because grandparents don't pay tax in South Carolina. So. Just be mindful of like who's making the gift and who's getting the deduction because maybe there's opportunities for mom and dad to gift to the children and then the adult children to make the contribution into the 529 to get the state tax deduction. So that's one thing to potentially think through. The other is making sure on the distribution side of the 529 that you're not eliminating potential tax credits that the child would have otherwise been eligible for. So just another example, I have a client in Colorado that mom's funded a big fat 529 plan for the child, but we wanted to use a certain amount of after tax money to pay for education, not use all 529 money, because if we would have used all 529 money, we would have not been eligible for either a lifetime learning tax credit or the American Opportunities Credit. And so we wanted to make sure we blended the right amount of money out of the 529 in addition with paying some educational expense out of pocket 
to make sure we took advantage of that tax credit. So again, just some unique things, whether it's money going in or money coming out to potentially think through when it comes to 529s. I I would agree with both your points, Dave, very well placed because I learned quickly when I for those of you who don't know, I use, I do my own taxes and just for, not just for, because I like the pain of doing it, but because I, I like to learn. And, and I found that out early on when I was, when I was doing my first son's taxes, that you have to kind of use a balanced approach between, between a 529 and out of pocket to maximize the AOC, the, the American Opportunity Credit. So that's, that's actually a very good point. And in a situation like this, Dwayne, did you have like the child, your son file a separate tax return in order for him Correctly. to- Correctly, correct, right? yeah. Because you would have been disqualified, I'm assuming, you, would have not, you wouldn't have been qualified for taking the credit. No, not not yeah. for me. I, I had him file his own tax return uh, because uh, that way he, he, got, he got the maximum credit. Right, and you, and you do it, I just want to mention, you can't double dip. So no, you have to be careful no, about that. You can't take the withdrawal from the 529 for the full amount of college or all the expenses and then use the American Opportunity Tax Credit or Lifetime Learning Credit. So you have to be, you have you to have to be very careful. To you, have, you have to be very careful with your planning. Yes, uh, uh, that's absolutely true. Um, Let's address that question, quick question in chat from Peter, because it kind of goes along with what you guys are talking about. Like, can you address kind of how 529 plans are affected when it comes to like uh, FAFSA and the financial aid inclusion or excluded exclusion? Like, how does how does a 529, you, you kind of mentioned some of the tax side of it. What about when you're applying for actual financial aid? Yes, yeah, so this is new for 2024. So FAFSA, the kind of the rules changed starting in 2024. And if you haven't read kind of in the papers, whatever, FAFSA is like a complete mess right now. But be that as it may. So it used to be previously that grandparents' contributions to college. So if they, if a grandparent paid the child's tuition, that was treated as income on the FAFSA. That is no longer the case. So one of the changes to FAFSA is any amount that's paid by a grandparent, whether it's direct or from a 529, is not included uh, in the FAFSA. So it used to be we had all kinds of rules about when grandparents should be like giving money to the child. That is no longer the case. You don't need to worry about that anymore. So kind of even more advantageous for grandparents to save money in a 529 and then dole it out when, you know, whenever they want. Correct. And the money that's saved by the grandparents in a 529 plan is not counted against the student or in their expected family contribution calculation. And so if you have a parent-owned 529 plan, that's only 5.64% of that is considered against the student when applying for financial aid. Now, if the student were the beneficiary of their own plan, then 20% of that would be counted against them for financial aid. So um, if you look at college planning and how to plan for, for that aid calculation, you have to look at how the plan is structured and how it's owned. Uh, another thing that I should caution people with 529 plan especially, make sure that you have a successor owner set up on that 529 plan account. It is very important and uh, it's it's good for from a not only from an estate planning perspective but it just continues that control the 529 doesn't go through probate and it just it just continues that that plan for that beneficiary and another flexibility of the 529 plan is you can change the beneficiaries now there are some um some particulars about changing a beneficiary when you when you go same family or up a generation, there's uh, typically no issue. I have read some opinions that if you pass down to, or if you skip a generation, when you change the beneficiary, then there may be some some tax involved because you go into the generation skipping tax laws in that particular case. But in any case, from, from Peter's perspective, 5.64%, if your parent's asset 
twenty percent if it's if it's the beneficiary's own account. Perfect. Any other questions before we we kind of move on to to, to kind of wrap it up here? I've never seen a five twenty nine where the child is the owner. Would they even allow that, or are you talking about maybe if they like pass the age of eighteen and then become the owner? They can become the owner of their own 529 plan, and I think that's uh, relatively recent that the IRS has allowed uh, on that. But uh, you have to. But be not careful. as a minor, right? No, not as a minor. Yeah, no. I was going to say. Yeah, no, I've seen once they make the age of majority, they flip over. But I was, I was just sure. wondering if you've ever seen as a minor. I've seen the UGMA titling on a 529 plan but i haven't seen a minor and i don't think that's i don't think that you're going to find a custodian that will allow that gail asked a very good question in chat can anybody with pca can they sell or take over 529 plans through well, yeah, as a pca iar yes we currently have fidelity we have the 529 plans through fidelity available and that's uh, so that's a possibility I know that there are a lot of states that are that uh, do not allow advisor sold plans, and I am also looking at another one possibly to add in the future, but we're going to table that discussion for a little bit later. I think Seth is familiar with that one. Yeah, I do want to just add that you do need to make sure if you have a client in Illinois or New York or wherever, you do need to make sure you may not be able to manage it, but really you need to, I, I would strongly suggest that it get recommended to the client use that that state specific plan because of the tax benefits to them. Yes. Yeah, you have to be very careful how you approach that because there are states that as I as I mentioned earlier that will not offer tax breaks to anything outside of the state. So when you look at that particular state's plan or where your client is uh, residing and where they file income taxes, you have to be cognizant of that. Uh, fact. I also want to mention, I don't think overall, I think 529s have a lot of advantages, but I don't want to completely write off Roth IRAs as a tax savings tool as well. Just something to consider because the earnings would not be subject to a 10% penalty if used for college. Contributions are obviously tax-free when withdrawn. And if you're over 59 and a half and you've passed the five-year rule, you can, you have no tax on the earnings as well. So that certainly could be a tool in the toolbox. Negative is can't use that, but you lose further tax-free growth. But again, it could be an option. Hey, Stoyan, I just wanna jump back to the PCA thing real quick with 529s and talk about my experience. I brought on the Fidelity plan to PCA. I would not utilize or try to get 529s on like an ongoing basis. I agree with Seth totally. Like I just refer my clients to their state plan and we could even help them walk them through setting it up and funding it. But where I do utilize the Fidelity plan is if I have a client who has purchased predominantly an advisor 529 plan that another advisor sold them on in a state like for example, my California clients, and it's a large balance I will in many times roll that 529 plan over to the Fidelity 529 because, again, there's no state tax deduction to worry about in the first place, and it's already funded. And then I do not charge an advisor fee on it. And in many cases, if they're using like an American Funds Advisor 529, they might be paying 50, 75, 100, 150 basis points and fees in that. And I could basically move that over to the Fidelity 529 and it's like 17 basis points or something of internal expenses. And I just do that as a value added to the client and it helps reduce the overall fees the client is paying because I'm charging the client a fee on all their other money, their retirement accounts and everything. And I've done that for several high net worth clients that I've won from like Morgan Stanley, where mom and dad will move six or seven million over to me. They'll have two or three or 400,000 in 529s. And I do that as a service and don't charge a fee. And it's really helped just solidify the value proposition. But I wouldn't be doing it for clients that are like, hey, I just want to make a $5,000 contribution. It's not worth the time, the hassle, the headache to administer at PCA. 
I would just refer those ongoing contributions right into their state plan. And then at a time where maybe they do have 100, 200,000 in the 529, you could look at doing the rollover to the fidelity plan if you want. But I would just share that as a best practice. Thanks. One one other point that I would add to what Seth said earlier before before we disband the, the call, there's a fascinating planning option with from the Secure 2.0 and the Roth rollover opportunity. Personally, what I have done is, for example, once my older son got out of college and I depleted his 529 plan, I left like 50 bucks in there so so the plan stays alive and then i reserve the right once all my kids are out of college i reserve the right to continue contributions into that plan and then and have him roll it over to his roth because it's a seasoned money now it's it's been open for over 15 years so there are some fascinating opportunities to plan for that stuff there's one other caveat is that any money contributed in five years, Doyon, it has to stay in. Correct. So it's not just the 15-year rule. There's a second timing rule as well. So you yep. can't just put the money in and then the next year move into the Roth. you got to be careful on the timing. Yep. But yep. Right. I, right. I just want to add that some states are treating that as that rollover to a Roth as income. I think we could certainly do a more advanced 529 yeah. topic probably in the future. Sounds like there's a lot of planning opportunities. We are unfortunately out of time. Just want to thank you all for your participation today. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Stoyan. Obviously, Dave, thank you for you also chiming in. Don't forget to tune in next week. We have Kirsten and Betsy Larson talking about special needs, legacy planning. Don't want to miss, miss it. See you next Thursday. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Bucket Plan On Demand, brought to you by C2P, an organization whose purpose is to educate, train, grow, and support holistic financial advisors so families can achieve true prosperity. Subscribe today for the latest episodes and insights. Visit c2penterprises.com to learn how we can help support and enhance your advisory business. At the time of delivery and any subsequent publishing, information was deemed reliable but is subject to change by the time of listening or viewing. The contents of this piece include options and projections of C2P, are subject to change, and are for informational purposes only. The information provided in this presentation is not intended to be individual investment, tax, or legal advice.